it's difficult to increase the supply of money, uh, which means that its value will tend to be stable. But of course, uh, with the age of discovery, a lot more quantities of precious metals came into Europe and the other parts of the old world from these discoveries. And that certainly increased the supply of gold and silver turned into coinage and uh, traded in bullion. So there was uh, some inflationary tendencies with the increase in the supply of money. Plus there are some other things that we, should, we could talk about too in terms of countries like Spain and Portugal, uh, which uh, managed to capture a lot of this money supply, but they themselves were not very good at manufacturing things. And so most of the money that flowed into Spain and Portugal from Central and South America ended up finding its way into Northern Europe, where manufacturing goods were far, far more accessible and the money supply tended to increase prices. So it had, had a complicated impact on the stability of prices throughout Europe as the money supply increased. And so that was part of the reason why uh, there needed to be a greater standard. And the Bank of Amsterdam, founded by the Dutch, uh, helped to establish that standard, um, creating the Bank of Deposit in 1609. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. Uh, the lecture tonight, I'm going to focus on how the system of money and banking and credit evolved and developed in the United States. Um, I'm not sure how far along we'll get in this lecture. There's a lot of material to cover. But uh, it's important to start out by going back a little bit to the very beginning and talk a little bit about what happened in Britain. And the reason for that is that, that Britain emerged in the 17th century as the dominant European power uh, that was expanding its colonial footprint uh, in North America. And this is a, uh, an interesting cartoon that kind of tells the story. You can see that uh, the mother country under the mercantile system or mercantile system, uh, I've, I've heard the word pronounced both ways over time, mercantile system or mercantile system. Uh, and the colonies would produce supplies of precious metals. They would produce raw materials and foodstuffs sent uh, to the mother country on generally ships owned by Britain and then turned into finished goods that would be resold back to the colonies. And so it was a closed economic system. Although when I say that, there was plenty of leakage. Um, you can think about the fact that in any island nation, such as Great Britain, uh, there's a great deal of opportunity to have goods uh, leave markets without the government and the bureaucrats really knowing what's going on. And then it's shipped over across the ocean to North America, and the same, same situation exists. If, if, if they're brought into Boston, certainly the goods are going to be examined by officials and given the approvals that are appropriate at the time. But uh, what if the ship decides to offload some of its goods well, it's still a little bit out to sea, and uh, a second ship manages to make its way up to another uh, harbor where there aren't any officials looking. And so smuggling and avoiding the tax, taxes on, on uh, tariffs uh, and other, other import duties were a way to um, lower the cost of goods purchased and also keep prices down. And, and you have to look at this as part of the economic system that although it was designed to be a closed system, there's plenty of leakage that goes on. Well, uh, in the colonies of North America, in the British colonies, the, the colonial people relied pretty much on credit amongst themselves because there was a significant shortage of coinage. And so British merchants provided the goods to colonials on credit, and they kept up that relationship, you know, throughout the, the colonial period uh, during what I 
what, what historian named Charles Andrews has called the period of salutary neglect. And this is really all the way up through the Seven Years' War. Uh, and after the Seven Years' War, things began to change because the cost of fighting the French, uh, not just in North America, but elsewhere, was enormous. And so the British purser uh, was looking for additional revenue and the colonies were obviously a source of revenue that they could, they could try to draw upon. Well, uh, it's good to understand a little bit about the British history of its financial system. And the stage is set for what became the Britain's financial domination of its colonial subjects uh, long before the first settlements actually occurred in North America. In 1565, a, a British uh, citizen named Thomas Gresham provided the funds for the construction in London of what became the nation's Royal Exchange or Bourse. And, and it was his idea to compete with the Bourse that was in Antwerp, which had been the center of financial transactions and financial relations among European powers up to that period of time. And Gresham uh, basically used uh, the profits from his successful business ventures to create the first bourse to try to compete with the Dutch. Well, Gresham uh, used the money to build this building. Uh, it, and it was the first bourse in London. <clears throat> this building actually burned down, however, uh, in the Great Fire of London in 1666. So all that investment went up in smoke pretty, pretty quick. Um, but he decided to rebuild it. And after three years, a new structure went up and it lasted until another fire occurred in 1838. Well, <clears throat> Gresham's in, uh, importance in the British financial system really can't be uh, uh, explained in a short period of time, but he became extremely powerful in his relationship with the monarchy and particularly with Elizabeth. He came to manage the, the crown's royal debt in, in Europe's money markets. And he himself was a strong proponent of trying to maintain a stable cur uh, currency, um, not only to manage the country's debt, but also to try to keep Britain's exports competitive. And he felt that a stable um, money, uh, a money with a stable value would be uh, instrumental to Britain's economic prosperity. So at the time, a lot of what was happening, if you remember what I mentioned about coinage <clears throat> being uh, shaved because, and, and uh, debased, well, there was still a lot of this kind of particularly silver coinage in circulation in Britain. And even just through wear and tear, the coins would lose some of their metallic content not even from being shaved, but just from being passed around for, for decades and decades. And so uh, he convinced Queen Elizabeth to recall all the outstanding silver coinage and have it melted down and reminted. And this way it would give the coins a much higher silver content. And as a result, the value of the currency increased back to what it's originally originally was, was desired to, to uh, be valued at, and inflation came down in Britain, which, which was a dramatically uh, important part of their uh, economic plan to become an export uh, uh, economy. Well, uh, the basis for his analysis came to be known as Gresham's Law in the mid 19th century. It wasn't referred to in any way like that uh, during his lifetime. But what Gresham had, had simply observed is that over time, war, worn down coins lost some of their metallic content and so their value. But the government was treating those coins as having the same value as new coins. And so it meant that in the market, uh, worn coins were overvalued and the new coins were undervalued. And thus, holders of coinage would tend to hoard newly issued coins so long as the old coins were accepted uh, in exchange with the same purchasing power. So uh, in having the coinage 
recalled and reminted what he basically was doing was ensuring that the money supply would increase, that people would no longer have a reason for hoarding new coinage. And so it, it would be made available for purchases and for commerce. And so the money supply would increase and it would be available for, for use for establishing credit, et cetera. So that was part of his main innovation in terms of putting the Britain, Britain's financial situation on good standing. Um, thanks in part to his influence over the nation's business uh, and, and their finances, many of Britain's uh, seaports began to really blossom. Uh, it expanded uh, its, its um, internal transportation network. And so raw materials and goods were making their way all across Britain to the coasts and onto ships for export. And, and, and they were sold uh, not just to the colonies, but also to Spanish and Portuguese merchants who were in desperate need for these goods that couldn't be produced domestically. And in, re in return, they, the Britain's merchants took in gold and silver coinage in the bargain, and some of this money made its way into the British treasury, of course. Um, and you know, what, the, what is important about that to note is that at this point in time, and even up to fairly recent times, the quantity of gold and silver that a nation's treasury had was thought to be an, a, a perfect measurement of the wealth of that country. In other words, uh, you know, hoarding a supply of gold and silver in your vaults was a desirable economic activity. The more gold and silver a country had, the thought was the, the stronger that country was, the more wealthy that country was, independent of, in a sense, the goods and services that were being produced by the economy. So it, it arguably was a sort of a false analysis of what constitutes a sound economic uh, system, but it is, as we all know now, it would, you know, people are still investing in gold as a hedge against inflation and as a a means of guaranteeing that they have some sort of, of net worth that will never disappear as long as the desire for gold and silver doesn't disappear. Well, uh, <clears throat> one of the great changes that was happening in Britain as a result of the privatization of land ownership and the gradual enclosure of the commons was that the agricultural land in Britain was being converted rapidly from uh, farming and crop production to the raising of cattle and sheep uh, to satisfy uh, growing export markets. So labor isn't, isn't needed as much. And so people are moving into the cities and when, when they're finding living conditions in the cities difficult, they're moving to the ports and eventually getting on ships to head for other parts of, of the world where Britain is establishing its colonial output, outposts. At the time that, that Gresham was, was uh, alive, Britain had already uh, moved along this course pretty strongly and its main export was wool and particularly woolen cloth. Uh, there were about 11 million sheep uh, scattered throughout the British Isles at, at that time. And more and more land was diverted all the time to raising sheep for the uh, woolen export market. Now, beginning in 1651, the British uh, Parliament passed the first of what was called the Navigation Acts. And that required that only English owned ships would carry goods into England and that the colonies in North America could only export their tobacco, sugar, and other commodities to England. So here's the perfect closed system that I described by the term mercantilism. Um, and again, uh, it's, it, it's a quasi-monopolistic structure because if you can only import manufactured goods from England and only sell your goods to England, where are the prices going to be set? They're not going to be set by competitive market conditions. They're going to be set by, uh, you know, 
by those who have a vested interest in and ra raising the price of manufactured goods sold to the colonies and keeping the price of raw materials as low as possible. So that's the situation that British colonies find themselves in as they're beginning to uh, uh, experience the ad additional imposition of taxes after the Seven Years' War. All along, uh, the need for self-reliance in the colonies, it stimulated the, um, the settlers to establish a number of publicly owned banks. So the Quakers in Philadelphia were first, were the, really the, one of the first to organize these institutions to serve the credit, credit needs of their own communities. Um, and Benjamin Franklin was very much involved in this process in, their, in the second quarter of the, of the 1700s. Um, and, and he responded to an inquiry on the source of Pennsylvania's prosperity uh, from, a, from an English uh, 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 writer. And here's what he said in response to, to why the colony, the Pennsylvania colony was so prosperous and it was expanding so quickly. He says, this is simple. In the colonies, we issue our own money. It's called colonial script. We issue it in proper proportion to the demands of trade and industry to make the products pass easily from the producers to the consumers. In this manner, creating for ourselves our own paper money, we control its purchasing power and we have no interest to pay for no, to no one. Um, and in a, in, in a principle we'll eventually get to, that raises a real question of whether or not uh, paper money needs to have any backing. Does it need to have gold and silver backing it? Does it have to have anything specific behind the money? Or is, is it sufficient to simply have public confidence by managing the supply of money based on what the economy demands and needs? And in Franklin's comment here, he, he's suggesting that, that sound public policy has meant that this money supply, this colonial script is doing a really good job and that they're not being uh, neg negatively affected by inflation. Well, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot more to that story, of course, because in wartime, it's very difficult to, uh, to maintain that sort of stable value for the currency. And we'll go into that a bit. <laughs> Did I hear somebody with a question or wanted to say something? No. Just clearing clearing your throat. <laughs> anyway, any, any questions so far? Let me stop and ask. Yeah. Yes. yes, Mary, Polly. Hi. Uh, yeah, how, how exactly did uh, Benjamin Franklin et al. go about issuing script? Uh, script? Well, he had a printing business. And he had the contract from the colonies, so right. he did. He did very well. Uh, you know, the Pennsylvania, the the the, the governor uh, and the colonial legislature would decide, you know, how much money they wanted to have printed. They would give Franklin the order, and he would print it, uh, turn it over to the, the the colonial treasury, and they would spend it into circulation. Okay. Pretty, you know, pretty straightforward. Now. Polly, I won't guarantee that there was no corruption going on, but it, but at least in Franklin's opinion, it was working pretty well. Uh, now, what gold or silver coinage existed in the colonies was used to pay for imports from Britain, because the British the British merchants would not accept the colonial script. So, what? You know, if they were unwilling to extend credit over a long period of time, eventually they wanted to be paid in money. And so some somewhere along the line, the colonial uh, merchants had to come up with hard money. However, uh, you know, it meant that they had to sidestep the regulations against trade with the Spanish in particular, because in the southern part of North America, uh, of the, 
you can you can see by the map it was it was controlled by the Spanish and so a lot of Spanish dollars were in circulation and it was this was the main form of coinage and of course Spain because of what it was able to extract from Central and South America had a fairly significant uh, supply uh, of 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 gold and silver that it could bring to its purchases. So some of this money was making its way into colonial merchants' hands, and it was used actually to pay for the goods that it was buying from Britain as well as from, uh, from other countries. Well, Frank, hey, had a, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, Keith Mundy here. Yes. I, I've got a question which might sound a bit odd, but the gov once Franklin prints the money and gives it to the government, how did the government get it into the hands of the, the merchants or the people that are going to use it? Do they give it to them or do they trade it for something? How well, they use they it to work? buy things. I mean, the, gov you know, the, the government needed its, its own goods, so it would use the money to buy its goods and spend it into circulation. Now, uh, again, the, um, the public banks would issue their own banknotes as well. So uh, there's no regulatory requirement on them as at this point to, to the extent of how much gold and silver coinage they needed to have in the vaults to back their paper issuance of notes. But they're largely lending to com a community of people who know one another and trust one another. And so there's a high level of trust. Um, and as we get on to this story, it just makes sense. It, it, this, this structure travels all the way across the country and that local banks run by a trusted group of people in the community um, are able to issue bank notes pretty much at some multiple of whatever species they have in the vault. And, and without any risk of a run on the bank under most circumstances. And so if I am living in Philadelphia and I, uh, I'm buying something from a Quaker and the Quaker wants to pay me in notes from that Quaker owned bank, even though I'm not a Quaker, I'll probably accept it because I know that in the next transaction, I can use that script to pay for the goods that I want and that person will accept it. Now, uh, let, let, let me take take you out of Philadelphia. And so I go to the next you know, sizable town, let's say it's uh, Lancaster, out in, a little bit west, west of Philadelphia. Well, uh, that, bank, that bank there, uh, that merchant in, in Lancaster that I wanna do business with might accept my Quaker bank notes from Philadelphia, but he doesn't know the people. So he might say, uh, instead of, of of honoring the, the face value of the note, uh, I'll take it with a 10% premium. In other words, I'll give you 90 cents worth of value for a, for a $1 note. And then the further away you get from Philadelphia, the more of a discount will occur. And, and eventually it might, you know, you might run into a bank, you might run into a merchant that's out in Western Pennsylvania that's established in Pittsburgh who will say, I don't, you know, I'm not going to, I don't take uh, notes from a bank issue, uh, uh, from a bank based in Philadelphia. So gradually the note will be discounted out of value be, just because of the lack of familiarity. And, and that, that became the ba basis of independent banking all across the United States from time to time. Is that, is that uh, Alec? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so it, uh, is it the case that there was an exchange rate between the colonial script and uh, uh, the uh, English pound? Um, not, there's no one exchange rate. Okay. Exchange rates are going to be very different, different, uh, you know, based on the willingness to accept the currency of whatever bank issued the notes. And so uh, uh, at this point in time, there's no bank 
There's no issuer of currency in the colonies that is strong enough to come close to par to a British banknote. Uh, I don't know what the discount rates would be, but uh, okay. I haven't, let me put it this way. I haven't seen any list of discount rates in any history book on, on monetary history that I've been able to find. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I just haven't seen one. But there must be a way in which the currency, the local currencies must be translated into yes. an English currency in order to have trade with England. Yes. Um, yeah. And and I would, I would imagine that to the extent that a Quaker-owned bank in Philadelphia was able to hold British pounds as reserve currency, <clears throat> that their that the rate on their own script would have been greater than a uh, from a bank that had no British pounds as reserves. Yeah, yeah. So this is these are these are uh, the floating exchange rates are going to be based on the willingness of parties to engage and the trust that they have in the the final ability to settle the accounts. Yeah. <clears throat> but but there's but what's going to happen? And I'll go into it. Right now, in the early 1700s, there's still a great uh, informality in the relations between Britain and the colonies. And as I said, the end of the Seven Years' War really starts to change things. Uh, that period of salutary neglect begins to end, and Britain is looking much more closely at uh, in invoking laws and tax policies that directly affect the colonies, which had not been in place up to that period of time. So going back to 1729, Franklin actually deals with uh, the money issue in a tract that he writes titled A Modest Inquiry into the Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency. And uh, this is a pretty remarkable document. It's generally available on the internet uh, and it, it's worth reading because it has a, a remarkable insight. It tells you a lot about Franklin as an intellectual and someone who's a, who is a shrewd business person. And he has a grasp of, of economics that is pretty remarkable for yeah. someone without any formal education. And he, he basically, uh, you know, deals with the question of uh, how, how important uh, it is that government issue paper money as opposed to private, the private individuals. Um, and, and he writes in this tract as follows. He says, a great want of money in any trading country occasions interest to be at a very high rate. And here it may be observed that it is impossible by any laws to restrain men from giving and receiving exorbitant interest where money is suitably scarce. Yeah. So interest being, interest being the price of money. Yes, interest being the price of money. So um, <clears throat> this is one reason why Gresh Gresham was so adamant about having the money supply of Britain reminted and as it gradually expanded, it would be available for lower cost credit to the merchants that, that were doing business in the, the wool trade and other trades to expand their reach. He goes on to say, a plentiful currency will encourage great numbers of laboring and handicraftsmen to come and settle in the country. Now the more inhabitants, the greater demand for land, upon which it must necessarily rise in value and bear a better price. So, uh, you know, it's also key. Credit is, in Franklin's view, extremely important for attracting settlers. Uh, settlers need land. They need credit to buy land. And the more credits available to people to buy land, the higher the price of land will tend to be. Ed, quick question. This is Marty. Yeah, Marty, hi. You mentioned uh, this was in 1729 that he wrote this? That's yes, correct. According to my calculations, that means he was just 23 years old? Is yep. That that's about, that's, yep. Pretty impressive. Huh? It, For somebody uh, who didn't have formal education. That's it, Everything you read about Franklin is, is, is makes you feel humble by his accomplishments. Uh, now, 
This is long before he had really an opportunity to study the great works of, of the political economists of his era. I, you know, I assume he did some reading, but eventually he would come under the spell of the French political economists, the physiocrats. Um, you know, in his autobiography, he talks about uh, meeting with the leading uh, leader of the physiocrats, Francois Quenet, as the most important meeting of his life. Uh, and he, uh, you know, embraced their, their, their analysis of how economies work and their, their basic fundamental uh, philosophy and principles. But uh, that would be down the road. In 1731, he is when he obtained the contract to print Pennsylvania's paper currency. And as I said, this proved to be a very extremely profitable endeavor for him. Um, and, you know, by the time he was a fairly young man, he was able to pretty much retire from his business ventures. Uh, he had an uh, extensive uh, uh, printing business with printing operations scattered all, all around uh, Pennsylvania and I don't know how many other colonies, but you know, he, he was basically financially independent and so he could spend a lot more time on public affairs and public public uh, interest. So, fast forward to when when the war for independence is, independence is on, Franklin is thinking again about how to raise the the revenue to pay for the war, and he makes this observation, which is kind of consistent with what he had said decades earlier. He he writes. The general effect of the depreciation among the inhabitants of the states has been this, that it has operated as a gradual tax upon them. Their business has been done and paid for by the paper money, and every man has been paid his share of this tax according to the time he retained any of the money in his hands and to the depreciation within that time. And what he meant by that is, is sort of what I said about, about private banks issuing currency. Uh, when the Continental Script was first issued, uh, people tended to take it pretty much at, at face value. Uh, over time, as prices went up, the currency lost its value, and but it was still used as legal tender. It was acceptable to pay your taxes. It was acceptable for purchase of goods and services. And so it kept in use and from Franklin's point of view, when it finally lost all its value, that basically removed any obligation on the part of the government to redeem it. And so he saw that paper currency, uh, even though it depreciated down to nothing, still served a very good common purpose. Now, it meant that no one lost a great deal in every transaction. Everyone lost a little bit. So uh, I, I think it has something to do why, why with some economists have argued that a little bit of inflation every year is not a bad thing. Uh, you know, Polly might be able to comment on that. I think Milton Friedman once said that uh, we ought to control the money supply uh, so that we had about an average of 2% inflation a year. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a lot of a lot of argument over how the money supply should be managed, and you know it has it has all these components of contributing to the, the the demand for money. Is there enough? Is there an oversupply of money? If there's an oversupply of money, what will happen to prices? Uh, you know, if interest rates are too high or too low, they'll either stimulate speculation or they'll prevent the uh, merchants in an economy from, from acquiring enough credit to continue to producing, et cetera. So it's a delicate balancing act that they seem to all have realized uh, surrounded the production of money and the use of money. Well, the first paper currency was actually produced by the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And this was used to pay the soldiers who had fought against the French. Um, other colonies followed in the issuance of paper currency. And what gave this currency, which were called bills of credit value, was its use as payment of taxes and other government services. So here again, 
It's not so much, it was thought that the currency had to be backed by anything tangible, so long as the government accepted it in payment of taxes and, uh, and any other government services that might have been provided. So that's how the money got circulated. One interesting characteristic then, of these, yeah. So then the value of the currency depends on whether or not the government accepts it for payment of taxes and not on the basis of it being backed by gold, silver, cattle, whatever it is. That I think is an extremely important point to make. And, and the question is, is it a reliable point over time and under all circumstances? I mean, this is, again, there, um, it depends on those issuing the paper currency yes. to, to know when there's too much or not enough currency in circulation. It also depends on there not being any shocks to the system. So, you know, uh, if, if in time of warfare could be a shock, a major natural disaster could be a shock. Um, and so there's a, there's a strong dependency on paper money retaining its value in that all other things are equal, that there's a great deal of stability in the society and in the economy in general. Isn't that the case also if it's backed by gold? Same, uh, same conditions, no? <clears throat> well, uh, I, huh. my, I'm trying to think of the best answer I can give you on the spur of the moment. The, the answer, like I said, depends on where you are in a society. So, uh, um, holding tangible goods, including precious metals, uh, in a time of scarcity will be better than holding paper currency. So if there are conditions of scarcity, then the price of tangible goods is going to go up. Yeah. And, and paper money will lose its value. So this is what I mean about all things being equal. And so, uh, some people were, are going to hedge the future by, by holding in reserve things that don't depreciate and that will have value in times of scarcity. Now, you cannot consume gold and silver, but, um, but even in times of scarcity, people will generally accept gold and silver in payment for scarce goods that are needed. And so, so that I, this is why I don't, I can't seem, I, I don't, I can't personally answer you with a definitive yes or no. I think, I think it's a conditional situation. Good point. Thank you. Now, um, one of the things that added to the, to the use of these cur currency was that, um, and, and some of you will remember that this, this condition existed in the 1930s to some extent in the United States for a while, and that the bills of credit had to be used by a certain date or they would lose their value. So they had an expiration date. And so for that reason, you couldn't hold on to them, uh, you know, expecting that, that their value would necessarily go up because if you didn't spend it into circulation, it would expire and you would lose the ability to use it. And so uh, in the 1930s, as I, and I remember, I don't remember all the details off the top of my head, but there, I think it was the, uh, uh, the city of Chicago that was issuing script in the, to, there was such a shortage of Federal Reserve notes or treasury notes uh, of what people would call cash during the depression. And they issued script, um, yeah, I think, as I recall, it was the economist Irving Fisher who came up with this idea, and the script had a, an expiration date, um, and it was and it was being circulated in the local economy until uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the Supreme Court uh, ruled ruled that this was unconstitutional. Well, getting back to the the early part of this story, 
Uh, Marty, you have your hand up. I see it. I see it. I don't know how long you've had it raised, and I apologize if I missed it. No, that's all right. I, I asked the question before, but I, I see this note has a date of 1690. So that was even before Ben Franklin's time. Yes. Yes. And, and you know, and of course, uh, Franklin would have had access to some of these early documents. And that's, you know, he may have used that, those documents and that information as a reference for the track that he wrote. Um, uh, and very few of us have purely original ideas. I think we all borrow from others <laughs> and we stand on the shoulders of other people who were, who came up with brilliant insights uh, over the course of their lives. Well, in 1764, uh, the British Parliament passed the Currency Act and that prohibited colonial governments from issuing any more paper money at all. So, so now Britain is, is posturing to take total control over the finances of the colonies. This is a copy of the front page of this, this piece of legislation. And the effect was to impose great hardships on the colonial subjects and their governments. <clears throat> How were they expected to uh, raise the revenue to pay the new taxes that were being imposed by Britain? Uh, there was, again, this dramatic shortage of precious metal coinage in the colonies. In 1775, there are no commercial banks in any of the colonies. And this desperately short of, coin of coinage, each colony began to violate the Currency Act and to issue notes. So uh, it, the, the, the war for independence isn't quite fully underway, but already uh, the colonies are each issuing their own paper currency in order to try to fund their activities. And, uh, and this is out of necessity. They really don't have any choice. Uh, of course, the Continental, Continental Congress also began to issue their own continental currency. Um, the currency was, was not backed by anything in particular. Uh, it experienced a lot of depreciation for two main reasons. One was that it was not used for direct payment of taxes. Um, and the main reason there was the Continental Congress had no powers to directly tax the, the people. Uh, the Continental Congress was dependent on getting revenue from the states who were asked to tax their people in order to fund the Continental Congress in the war. And also the second thing was that the British flooded the colonies with counterfeit currency. Oh boy. And, uh, and, and that, that is an early and re often repeated way for countries at war to try to destroy the other, the opponent's economies. If you can, if you can flood the country with counterfeit currency, then you're going to stimulate inflation and, and general price increases. Well, <clears throat> the colonies are starting to get desperate, of course. And so they decide that the best thing they can do is charter a bank. And so in 1781, the Continental Congress charters the Bank of North America. Uh, it's located on Chestnut Street, west of Third Street in Philadelphia. And the campaign was led by none other than Alexander Hamilton and by Robert Morris, who was then the superintendent of finance. And uh, he drafted the legislation based on Hamilton's design. So in this respect, you can say that Hamilton is the architect of the United States mixed economy. Uh, he believed in government intervention in the economy, management of the economy up to an extent, but he also was a strong advocate of free market enterprise. Well, <clears throat> this, the bank was really successful. Um, within a very short period of time, uh, the shares that were, that were issued were all sold, um, two thirds of which were paid for with loans from the French and the Dutch. So, uh, individuals who, who, who uh, uh, purchase shares of stock in the bank acquire loans from the French and Dutch 
and in order to, to buy the shares in the bank. And they obviously assumed the bank was going to be sufficiently profitable that they could pay back their own creditors. Um, that was pretty optimistic when you think of it in, in 1781, because the war, although it had turned in favor of the colonials, was far from, from over. Although the, uh, uh, the bank was, was solidly capitalized, um, it had claims on gold and silver held in the Netherlands and France, but almost none in its vault. So again, a lot of the a lot of the 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 ownership of the bank shares was related to debt, and it was only because the bankers in the Netherlands and France stood behind the bank that its notes would circulate with relative stability, stable uh, purchasing power. Well, the bank began to issue its own paper currency. Uh, and then in 1783, the Congress and several states enacted legislation that permitted the Amer Americans to pay taxes with the Bank of North America notes. So with that step, it meant that the bank's notes became legal tender. And again, now, now you get back to this, if in fact the government is going to accept these bank notes to pay taxes and other fees, and then the government has the bank notes, it will use those to pay its employees to buy goods and services. That adds a great deal of stability and credibility to the Bank of North America's you know, paper currency. Well, although the, uh, the states really had no storehouse of precious metals to back uh, the paper currency that they were issuing, they did have one usually valuable asset to offer as banking. Anybody want to take a guess of what that asset was? Land. Land. That's, that's the asset that they had, you know, with particularly with the success of the war, you know, as I mentioned before, a huge territory is now being added to the original territory of the 13 now independent nation states. Uh, and as Robert Morris explained in a letter he wrote in 1782 about the situation, he said, a land tax would have the salutary operation of an agrarian law without iniquity. It would relieve the indigent and aggrandize the state by bringing property into the hands of those who would use it for the benefit of society. The objections against such a tax are twofold. That first, first, that it is unequal, and secondly, that it is too high. Um, and I'm not, he didn't really go on to further explain what he meant by this, or at least I haven't been able to find any additional uh, details on his views. But it's interesting already that Morris, who you know, may have been familiar with the physiocratic writings, as was Franklin, at least was aware that this was an option that the government had, and that it would have some positive, you know, impact. The problem, of course, is that, that it would mean that many property owners in the colonies would probably be very much set against it, because their primary economic activity at the time was speculating in the increase in land values. So the idea of bringing in a land tax to, uh, to provide the revenue for the government uh, was at least on the, on the table, but there were serious objections to it. Um, I don't know exactly what he meant that is unequal other than in a sense that you cannot tax every landowner the same because the land val the value of the land held is not going to be the same. And whether or not it's too high depends upon uh, the same kind of principle. Some, some owners of land, even if they have the same acreage, may have land that's valued much higher or lower than their neighbor. So um, there are, there are, problems with the administration of, of a land tax, but 
what I wanted to bring out in this discussion was at least it was understood that it was a good way, a means of raising revenue and that, and that just selling off the public domain, uh, you know, one parcel at a time might bring in some revenue, but it's going to bring in the revenue once unless you impose an annual tax on the value of the land that's held. So uh, this, is, this is part of the financial uh, decisions that have to be made. And, and every community today makes the same kind of decisions. Do we sell off our assets in order to raise money? And therefore, we give up essentially an income stream for the future in order to satisfy our immediate financial need. And, and, and towns and cities are making those decisions all the time, not just about their land holdings, but about you know, other assets, buildings that they own, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, it's, 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 a, it's a fiscal, financial, economic, social issue that's been with us from the very beginning. So Ed, can I interrupt one more time? I'm sorry. The, the one of it being too high um, and the objection coming from speculators that's just fine, you know. Speculation it does not contribute anything to the well-being of people in uh, in in the colonies, so it's justifiable to tax it. Since well, it's Alec, here's the income. yeah yeah here's the problem. Uh, the investors in many of the land companies included all of the uh, founding fathers yeah. and their and and their relatives. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I, you know, I, I do a lecture on George Washington and I, and I, and I basically title hit it, um, George Washington as the, as one of the uh, great land speculators of the colonial period. Yes. So, Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. so how do you get, how do you get people to vote against their self-interest in the common good for the, but for the common good? Yeah. And that's, it was a struggle then. And it is a struggle now. Uh, well, with the end of the war uh, for independence, there's a, a real fear, as in at the end of every war, that there's going to be economic instability. And inst instability did follow at the end. Uh, the Pennsylvania General Assembly was pressured by the bank's debtors to revoke the state charter. Uh, the bank did continue to operate with some difficulty under its congressional charter and also got a charter under uh, from the state of Delaware. So so the Bank of North America loses its state charter, but it continues to function. Um, and the bank, I did a little research on the history of the bank, um, and this will, I think, this, this says a lot of what's happened in, in the subsequent couple of centuries. The bank continued to operate independently until it merged with Commercial Trust Company in 1923. Uh, this was followed by acquisition in 1929 by an insurance company, then by First Pennsylvania Bank in 1955, uh, by Core States Financial in 1991, uh, then by First Union slash Wachovia in 1998, and most recently by Wells Fargo in 2008. <laughs> so, so the process of bank mergers and, call, and, and, and uh, consolidations and acquisitions uh, traces all the way back to the origin of our, of our banking history. And this is a photograph of the building, the, of the, of the uh, Bank of North America's building uh, that was demolished, unfortunately, in the late 1950s. Uh, the sad tale in Philadelphia, as in many other cities, is, is a, a fair amount of history. Historical buildings were lost uh, for whatever reason, uh, for urban redevelopment projects and, and other, other reasons, putting in new highways and such. For New Yorkers, I guess your your biggest challenge was how to deal with Robert Moses, and uh, and the and the great protests against his plan to 
to to put super highways going all over New York City. And uh, I guess thank thankfully Jane Jacobs and a few other the other other people stood up to Robert Moses. Uh, anyway, let's go on with our story here. Um, well, with the new constitution approved, Alexander Hamilton and others recognized that there was a need for a national bank and, it, and the need was growing more and more all the time. So in 1791, the first bank of the United States was chartered. It had a 20 year charter. It was renewed in 1816 and the name changed to the second bank of the United States. So it, it did its job during that you know, uh, period of, of chaos uh, during, during the first couple presidencies of the United States and a lot of, of foreign intrigue. You know, there was the uh, quasi war with, with France and Britain, uh, then the war of 1812. And so, um, you know, the nation's financial, financial situation was, was pretty weak, uh, but, but thanks to Hamilton, at least, under the first bank and the second bank, it made it through that period of time. But there was a great deal of uh, concern among the democratic, and I say small d democratic population at the time against this consolidation of financial power. And in the person of Andrew Jackson, it took uh, form. When Andrew Jackson became president, he opposed the bank uh, and he ordered that all federal deposits to, were to be removed in 1833 and redeposited with the state banks. And so from 1833 on for the next couple of decades, we had a very decentralized banking system in the United States uh, and with, with, the, with the banks in the states being the primary providers of credit. Well, in response, uh, the president of the Bank of the United States wasn't going to lay down and die. Nicholas Biddle was, was the president at the time. He began presenting state bank notes for redemption, calling in loans, and generally contracting credit. So with the, that strategy, Biddle hoped that a financial crisis would generate support for the bank's charter to be removed renewed in 1836, but uh, it backfired on it. Then the administra administration appointed, pointed to the dangers of a central bank that had this kind of power to disrupt the national economy. So it put another stake in the whole idea of creating a central bank. Um, it lost its federal charter in 1836, and four years later, it stopped operations altogether. <clears throat> so what we had after that in the United States was a system that was very decentralized, dominated by the state uh, charter banks. Now, this is also the period now that the West is starting to be conquered. When I say the West, it means that most of the tribal people who had occupied the area west of the chain of, of mountains, the Alleghenies and the Appalachians uh, had been moved west and, and were now being forced pretty much uh, on the west side of the Mississippi River. Um, and it's a slow process, but settlers are, have moved into this territory in a, in a major way. Um, there's no structure to speak of it's slowly being built, but you know people are living in a wilderness. Currency and credit were desperately needed to meet the needs of a growing economy. Um, roads had to be built. The first railroads uh, were starting to be uh, to grow by the 1840s, and slowly but surely, the crops that are being grown in the hinterland have to make their way to market make their way to the Mississippi River to be put on uh, ships to go down to the down the bottom of the Mississippi and and export it overseas, etc. So recognizing that 
there was a great need for currency and credit, the banking interests began to respond to that. Um, and one of the ways that they did it was to get uh, new regulations passed. So, oops, don't mean to expose you to Alan Greenspan quite yet. Uh, after 1816, the regulation of the banks was left up to the states in total. Federal government basically got out of the banking business altogether. New banks were subscribed with, with some uh, specie, some you know, requirement to hold gold and silver coinage, but control over issuance of banknotes was really ineffective. There was no real control over what multiple of banknotes could be issued by these state chartered banks uh, in respect to the amount of, of precious metals they had on in their vaults. So currency issued by what became by, by the 1840s, about 700 plus state banks was discounted, as I explained it earlier, anywhere from zero to 100% based on the public confidence in and knowledge of the banks and trust of the people who ran the banks. So uh, you have floating exchange rates between these currencies and, and no way to go to a bank and say, I'm, here's my bank note, I'd like to have my money, my, my gold and silver coinage. It wasn't, it wasn't something the banks could do. Well, uh, historians have looked at this situation uh, for, for a long time to try to determine whether or not it was good for the economy of the United States at the time uh, and bad or bad. And, and they generally disagree on the consequences of the period of minimally regulated banking. Um, reason I have Alan Span Greenspan here is because some years ago, he uh, made this statement in a speech he gave about this period. He said, more recently, some scholars have suggested that the problems of the free banking period were exaggerated. Retrospective analyses have shown, for example, that losses to bank note holders and bank failures were not out of line with other comparable periods in US banking history. Now, one could interpret that in a number of different ways. Um, it could be interpreted uh, that, well, it wasn't so bad, or it was no worse than it had ever been, even though it had always had been pretty bad. So, uh, you know, how do you measure the success? Well, was credit readily available for entrepreneurship, for people who wanted to expand their business opportunities? And was it available at a rate of interest that people could afford based on what prices they were able to gain in the marketplace? Um, well, the economy was expanding. So in that sense, maybe Greenspan you know, is, is correct. And that it has some bearing on his own attitude toward uh, the role that the central bank or government ought to play in uh, what you know what policies they could bring to the table to affect the economy, uh, and Greenspan was very much of a laissez-faire his uh, philosopher when it comes to the economy. So he, you know, during his tenure at as head of the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, he was very reluctant to use the, the extremist power, extreme powers of the Fed to intervene, uh, and we. You can make your own judgments about those years of whether or not they, they were better than would have been otherwise or worse than uh, would have been if, if uh, another person had been head of the Federal Reserve Board. Well, <clears throat> others have disagreed. Uh, one researcher that I came across, uh, Edward Simons, he wrote this in 1984 uh, about about the situation. And he says, in some states, particularly Michigan, where more than 40 banks failed before the system was declared unconstitutional, the system is better characterized as a fiasco than a failure. Um, and what, you know, what this leads to, to conclude, I think, is 
that public confidence in, in a particular banking system or even an individual bank um, has some basis in whether or not it's thought that the biz, that the those who are doing the, the banking business are doing it prudently. Uh, and to some extent, whether or not they are in fact holding sufficient quantities of hard money or specie in their vault that that are there for depositors to to withdraw when when and if they desire to do so. So here again, you know, it just points to the complexity of the impact of the financial system on the general economy. And uh, we'll get into some discussion about where we are currently. Uh, maybe not, I might not make it today, but, but next week for sure. Um, well, so the United States has up to this point now gone through a, a short period of strong central banking. Now it has a very decentralized, minimally regulated system. And as the country approached mid-century, the momentum for reform and the pressure to bring about greater monetary stability began to increase because the country was going through uh, its cycles of boom and bust. Um, you can almost say this, that based on the analysis that, that Henry George provided, uh, economists who have looked at the, the cyclical character of our economy have said basically, the economy has gone through an 18 to 20 year cycle of boom and bust, almost without regard to what financial system or banking system has been in place. Um, there have been panics and the financial panics have, have lasted long or short period of time, in part based on what government has chosen to do or not to do in response to those panics. Uh, sometimes making the right decisions and getting the economy back on, on its uh, upward path, and sometimes making very wrong decisions, causing the downward part of the cycle to last longer and to have a longer duration and a more serious impact uh, than in other times. But the question is, can any banking system prevent the cycle of boom to bust that we experience so regularly? And of course, there's constant debate about that particular question. Well, uh, with this momentum for reform, we get close to the Civil War. And by this time, the, there are 1,562 state banks. So the state banks are dominating the system at a time when the federal government is, is now going to be very much dependent upon international credit and raising taxes and coming up with a way to uh, fund the Civil War. And the uh, Lincoln administration submits and the Congress passes the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 1864. And these attempt to assert a degree of federal control over the banking system, but without the formation of another central bank. And what they do instead is create a system of national banks um, and establish a uniform national currency and an active secondary market for treasury securities to help finance the union's war expenses. So uh, this is their first effort at a major effort issuing bonds sold to investors uh, in the United States and elsewhere in order to raise the revenue necessary to fight the war. And with the hope, of course, that they're going to be able after the war is over to repay the debt based on, on uh, the economy stabilizing and beginning to grow again, sort of a supply side economic effect. And that is, uh, we're going to hope that uh, if we don't impose too heavy taxes, the economy is going to grow. And as a result, even without raising the tax rates, the federal revenue will increase. And that's, that's uh, something that we could talk about more in depth, but, but that was basically what Art Laffer and the other supply side economists were arguing in the late 1970s. Marty? I see your hand raised, but maybe it's still from the last time. I was on mute. 
I, I have a friend who's an avid uh, coin collector, and he uh, reminds me that there were many coins issued by the mints dating back to the late 1700s that were coins, I believe, of the United States rather than of individual states. So I'm just curious about the distinction between the, the paper money and the, uh, and the coinage. Yeah, well, the there's been a U.S. Mint in existence since that early time. And the Constitution actually says that the, the, the federal government has the power to mint money, to create money. And the definition of money at the time was not paper currency. I so I, I don't I don't remember any time that 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 there was an interruption in the power of the federal government to actually mint money. But here again, the problem is, where were they going to get the raw materials? I mean, it, it it's um, you have a weak federal government. Its basic powers of raising revenue come from tariffs and uh, and. You know, it, it operates in a pretty slim, you know, mu a budget for for most of it, of our history, and so there's not a lot of excess revenue coming in that could be used uh, to to put into mo money creation. I um, but I don't I don't I've never I, I've never seen any statistics on how much money was minted year to year from the mint, but. Uh, but I suspect there was some all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, okay. well, if I... and the other, the other you know, going back to Gresham, the, the real question is uh, people who were in possession of that coinage, uh, <clears throat> a lot of it never was circulated. So it, it remained hoard, held by, by holders of the coinage as an investment or as a hedge against inflation. And so that, you know, they might have something in reserve in the case that whatever paper currency was being used lost its value. And then they would have, they would potentially have some real money uh, to use if times got desperate. But, uh, but as you probably know, a lot of that coinage found its way eventually into the hands of, of, uh, of uh, collectors and, and, you know, it's no longer in circulation very, I don't know, how many years it would take for the coins, but but uh, a lot of it eventually was replaced by coinage that had a much less lower intrinsic value uh, than the nominal value stamped on the coins. Right, right, and 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 of course now, especially <clears throat> given the price of gold and silver, those coins are worth much, much more than the intrinsic uh, value stamped on the coins. So. Yeah, I you know I I. <laughs> I lament the fact that my uh, grandmother often gave us uh, silver dollars from the 1880s and 1890s as presents when we were kids. And of course, I didn't, I didn't save them. I went out and spent them. <laughs> um, I can totally relate. <laughs> I'm the anyway, same myself. So anyway, anyway. I, thank you for. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's a it's a really interesting question that you have. I just haven't researched it to see the, the, the history of how much coinage was actually created by the mint year to year uh, since it's since its founding. Uh, but that would be that would be something interesting to know. I'll see if I can tap tap into the knowledge my friend has, David. He, he actually lives in Cherry Hill. So, OK, probably a neighbor of yours. <laughs> so so the. You know, the, the Union government, I'm not going to talk about the Confederacy situation at all, but the Union government really had to come up with a way to raise revenue to pay for the war. And it needed to take control of, of the currency that was being issued. And it did so by coming up with its own currency. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, what it meant. Well, by 1870, because of these measures, things had changed pretty dramatically. There were 1,638 national banks now operating. Uh, the number of state chartered banks had fallen to just 325. So, you know, the, the national banks were winning this competition. And one, again, one thing, you have, you have the national banks that are holding uh, uniform currency issued by the federal government and you could use that 
that uh, currency as legal tender and you could pay your taxes with it and pay for fees for anything you needed to deal with with the federal government. So it just it's it moves the money issued by the state banks into an inferior position against the federal government. Well, <clears throat> the state banks didn't give up. Um, uh, they, they, they were creative and they wanted to win back their customers. Well, how did they do it? They came up with innovations such as checking accounts. And checking accounts became a major substitute for banknotes in circulation. Uh, <clears throat> we today take this for granted that, you know, we only rarely pull out cash out of our wallet to pay for a good or a service anymore. We don't even use checks anymore. We use our credit card or even, even then we don't use that. We use our, our iPhones to make a digital transaction. Well, by 1890, only 10% of the nation's money supply was still circulating in the form of currency. 10%. So, most transactions were being held, were being handled by the extension of credit, business to business credit, or payment by, by checks. Well, <clears throat> I thought it would be interesting to at least give you a sense of what was happening to the, uh, to the new community of freed uh, Blacks who came out of the Civil War looking for some economic opportunity. And they needed a banking system in, in a country that was still very much prejudiced against them and with, with segregation, a major obstacle. So the first real financial institution was established in 1865 as the Freedman Savings and Trust Company. And it was, was basically founded to serve former enslaved persons uh, uh, who had served in the Union Army. Uh, Lincoln signed the legislation for its charter uh, just a few weeks before he was assassinated. And by the early 1870s, the bank held deposits of about $4 million, roughly about 70, equal to 75 million today. And the reason Frederick Douglass is on, on this uh, slide is because he served as the bank's first president. Well, <clears throat> the Freedman Savings and Trust Company as you might guess, had an all white board of directors. And that board of directors was headed by Henry Cook, who was the brother of Jay Cook. Uh, and Jay Cook's banking firm had been instrumental in selling government bonds to fund the war. So this, this is a, a close knit financial community. And now they're extending their, their reach to the newly freed African-Americans. Well, in 1867, uh, the Freedmen's Bank moved from New York uh, City to Washington, D.C., and into this newly constructed building. So it was, it was doing pretty well up to 1867. Uh, well, what was happening in the United States economy? Well, it was moving very fast toward its next cyclical downturn. Um, and during this period, uh, before 1873, when the crash occurred, the bank's executives were making increasingly risky loans, uh, a lot, a lot to real estate speculators, and so Friedman's Bank failed along with many others. Um, its depositors, there was no deposit insurance back then. Its depositors and its shareholders lost whatever they had held in the bank and whatever had been invested. Um, the future of, of minority banking went through a long period of, of, of growth, largely because of segregation in the South. So most of the banks that were established with African-American owners and, and boards were built in the South. Uh, there were about 130 of them that were established through the Southern states after the 1870s. And Virginia had the largest number of those, of those banks. Well, <clears throat> the overall story gets, gets back into this struggle between the state banks and the national, national banks. 
combined with lower capital and reserve requirements, as well as the ease with which states issued banking charters, the state banks began again to become the dominant uh, presence by the late 1880s. 1880s. Um, again, they had offered new services and, uh, and they were winning back customers. Now, there's this battle between you know, the national banks, the state banks, uh, the degree of regulation that's imposed on the banks, the control over the issuance of bank notes and currency, and there's also a big battle that's going on uh, between the advocates of a gold-based money and a bimetal uh, structure that would include sol silver. Um, and the basis for that is pretty easy to understand because uh, there's not much gold in the West, but there are extensive silver mines that, that have been uh, discovered. And so the farmers and merchants in the West, they feel like, like the system is, of banking is being imposed on them from the Eastern establishment financial institutions, and they fight very hard to get uh, a system of bimetallism adopted. Um, one reason that uh, there's a problem be is because during the late 18th and uh, all the way up to this period in the 19th centuries, Europe and the, uh, and the United States had been drained of a large amount of silver because of the trade that they did with Asia and with China in particular. The Chinese wanted payment in silver. And so a lot of silver was moving out of the country. And so as a result of this, gold had gradually replaced silver uh, as the backing for most currencies. But again, the farmers in the West and merchants in the West had uh, very little gold to speak of, but they were mining, at least they were mining an increasing supply of silver. And the Westerners found a champion for their cause in the form of William Jennings Bryant, um, who campaigned for presidency a couple of different times. Uh, but in 1896, while he was campaigning for the US presidency, he delivered a, a speech, uh, which famously was called the No Cross of Gold speech. And he basically said, uh, he said this about the situation as it stood with, with gold being the primary form of coinage and backing for currency. He says, if protection has slain its thousands, the gold standard has slain its tens of thousands. So you know, his solution wasn't to go to just not back currency at all, but he he backed the idea of bimetallism, that gold and silver both should, should back the currency. There should be something tangible, yes, but gold is too limited in supply and it puts a constraint on economic growth. So why not add silver to the mix? Um, well, uh, in, in 1873, the legislation had been passed that basically embraced gold and demonetized silver altogether. And this was what they were fighting against. And this is the, a cartoon of the time that shows you know, the cross of gold that, that uh, William Jennings Bryan was alluded to, alluding to in his speech. Well, nothing really happened, but the controversy dissolved because the supply of gold increased after gold, uh, large supplies of gold were discovered in South Africa and then Alaska. So there's this, the gold rush is on uh, and new supplies of gold are, are coming into the market. Uh, and William McKinley as president, he persuaded the voters that bimetallism would be a detriment to business interests. And so Bryant was defeated and the controversy was, was put to bed at least you know, for a time. Well, <clears throat> even as the end of the 19th century came and went, the, the world's great commercial power remained Great Britain. 
Uh, the United States power was increasing, of course, but Britain was still at the top of the, of the heap. Um, and so for nearly two centuries, any trade imbalances were, were settled with gold and that gold moved in the direction of Britain. Uh, Germany uh, followed Britain in 1871 by establishing a gold, gold exchange standard and the United States finally conformed in 1873. So by 1900, only China and a few Central American countries had were still uh, backing their uh, currency with, with silver coins. Um, and I'm going to leave it here for tonight. Uh, we'll pick it up next week with the modernization of the system that occurs after the panic of 1907. Um, this, is, this is when what the US economy really gets shaken. And there is a firm conviction that something has to be done to solve the, the problems of monetary and financial instability, instability of the banking uh, system, and, uh, and a, lot of, a lot of political intrigue is involved as we get into the story. So I'll stop there for, for uh, tonight. Um, and open it up to comments and questions. I can stick around for however long anyone else would like to stick around, but let me finish it up uh, right there for now. Thank you. A lot, of, a lot of information. And what I would say to this is, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are, there are so many books to read about this. Uh, my recommendation <clears throat> is to get a hold of Carol Quigley's book. Tragedy and Hope. There are, are chapters that deal with all of the details, and I've used it uh, in part as a source document, source for a lot of information that I have. Um, if you don't know who Carol Quigley was, he was he was Bill Bill Clinton's favorite uh, professor uh, when he was at, at the university at um, George Mason, I think. So, any any thoughts? Marty, it looks like, uh, sorry, I'm calling him Marty. Uh, and it looks like Marty has a question. Okay. Well, Marty never took his yellow hand down, so I don't know if he <laughs> has a new question or not. I, I'm wondering. Okay, someone else wanted to ask something. Sure. Uh, Vanessa Batelli, I'd like to ask a question. Yes. Uh, hello. So thank you for your presentation. And I would uh, I would like to know if there's a way to um, catch up with the, the first one, because I, I wasn't able to see the first lecture because of a time difference. I, so I got mixed up with the time and then I ended up missing it. This one I was I, I managed to to see. I'm glad. Well, but okay. the first one I didn't. I don't know if there's a way to to see it. Uh, Ibrahim will, will tell you, I think he can provide you with a link. Has it been put up uh, and available yet, Ibrahim? Uh, yes, it's available and I'm actually sending a, a message on the chat. Okay, so look at the chat and you will have the link so you can, you can uh, listen to last week's uh, lecture and discussion. Excellent, thanks very much. You're welcome. Anyone else have anything you'd like to add? Alec. Yes, you, you said that the um, issue of the, that was brought up by the panic of 1907 was instability. The up and down uh, of the economy, which creates anxiety and creates uh, a great deal of uh, uh, trouble. My, my own sense is would you, well, let me ask you the question. Right underneath there, it talks about the war of wealth. So is the problem uh, instability or is it instability and inequality of income and wealth? Well, together. Yeah, of course it is. They're interrelated and, it, and it's a question of, of you know, cause and effect. So uh, if you have systemic flaws, which the financial system did and does, and you have systemic flaws in the system of law and taxation, 
which our system does, did and does, then they're going to interact with, with one another. And, uh, and the, the, the basic cyclical nature of our economy is a result. Um, I hope that, you know, I don't know if Polly's still with us, but I hope she would agree to me that there's no real need, there's, there's no real natural cause for our economics, economic experience to be cyclical, at least to the level that it does go through these booms and busts. Yes, certainly, certainly there would be, you're not going to have necessarily always steady economic growth. There are externalities, there are shocks to the system, but in general, uh, the boom to bust character is created by bad law and bad, bad policy. And so if you have bad law and bad policy in, in regard to taxation, in regard to the financial sector, in regard to corporate law and regulation, uh, then you know, when things go bad, they're going to be worse than they otherwise would be. And government is going to be less in a position to bring us out of that downward turn uh, because they, the government simply doesn't know what policies are uh, required to do so. I mean, our, our history has basically been for, for most of the history of the United States anyway, that <clears throat> economists argue that we should just let the markets come to their natural bottom. And then once the excesses are, are purged out of, of, our, of our experience, then the economy will start to recover again. But, but we have a problem with that because of the collateral damage. Yeah. You know, all the people that, that lose their homes, uh, you know, are suffering long-term unemployment, et cetera. So uh, that's, you know, that's not an acceptable approach to managing economic cycles. We need, we need to deal with these systemic problems. And hopefully, hopefully as we get toward the end of this course, uh, I will offer some ideas about what those solutions might be. Some ideas are my own and others I have borrowed from people I have a good deal of uh, admiration for. Yeah, thank you. Well, if nothing else, I will thank you all for joining me for another week and uh, we'll pick it up uh, next week from this point on in U.S. history. Um, I don't, I, I have to say this, I, um, I don't know if we'll be able to finish all that I had hoped to discuss in the six weeks that we had planned. Um, so when, when we get towards the end, we'll have to have a decision, a discussion, whether or not we can uh, go another week beyond the six that we had planned. And depending upon your level of interest, we can decide on doing that. Sounds good. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. I, I did find that the book Tragedy and Hope is available as a PDF oh, download cool. on the internet. So in case people are interested. It's a um, thousand pages. I, I oh. see that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of detail. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But but you can you can uh, you know skip through the sections. There are a lot are lots of it that you probably wouldn't have any direct interest in, but but uh, but it is a, a standard in terms of an analysis of the origins of the, the world's financial system in the 20th century in particular. Very if, interesting. If you, find that, if you find that book to be long, there is a, someone who tried to really condense it into a couple of uh, less than, I think, 200 pages. His name is Joel Skousen, and the title is totally different. It says, Naked Capitalism. Yeah. Okay, like the Cliff Notes version. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Th thank you very much. Ed. Okay, everyone. Have a real nice week okay. and uh, look yeah. forward to seeing you here again next Monday. Look forward to it. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Ed. Good night.